you probably think you already know purslane. That little red stem weed that pops up in your garden every summer or creeps through the gravel by your driveway. But did you know that it grew in Thomas Jefferson's garden? Yes, Thomas Jefferson. And yes, he planted it on purpose. Or that it can photosynthesize like a desert cactus. Let's dig into 10 things only foragers know about purslane. And if you can't help but wonder what things taste like, I hope you'll subscribe to the channel. Number one is ancient, like Mesopotamia ancient. Long before kale smoothies and baby spinach salads, people were tending purslane. Archaeologists have found its seeds tucked into clay jars and hearth ash in ancient Mesopotamia from over 4,000 years ago. This cradle of civilization in what's now Iraq is where humans first began experimenting with farming and city life. Those ancient farmers along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers didn't just stumble upon purslane. They harvested and cultivated its juicy leaves from gardens baked by the desert sun. They ate it fresh, used it as medicine, which we'll explore later, and carried the seeds with them wherever they moved, sometimes intentionally, oftentimes not. Purslane wasn't just known in Mesopotamia either. Ancient cultures across the globe valued it. Egyptians, Romans, Mayans, Aztecs, and Native American peoples such as the Cherokee and Ojibwe, all recognizing its culinary and medicinal prowess. It's truly one of humanity's oldest and far-reaching edible plants. Number two is a true world traveler. Needless to say, it didn't stay in Mesopotamia. Wherever people have gone, Purslane has followed. It hitched rides in ships, wagons, and even the soles of shoes is tiny seas traveling the world long before passports or visas existed. When European colonists reached the Americas, they were surprised to find purslane already growing wild. Archaeological evidence, like pollen dating back centuries, strongly suggest a pre-Columbian presence. Leading theories point to indigenous agriculturalists spreading the plant north from ancient Mesoamerica centers or through other earlier pre-Columbian crossings from the Old World. Purslane was also well known to African people brought to the Americas as enslaved laborers. Long before transatlantic slave trade began, the plant had already spread across Africa, where it was prized for its nutritional and medicinal properties. Once in the Americas, Enslaved African people recognized the plant's value and incorporated it into their diets and herbal practices. That culinary knowledge survives today, especially in Mexican cuisine, where the succulent greens, known as verdolagas, is often stewed with pork in traditional dishes. Because of all this, botanists call purslane cosmopolitan, found on every continent except Antarctica, at least for now a true citizen of the world, thriving wherever humans disturb the soil and the climate allows. And I'd guess, if humans ever make it to Mars, I wouldn't bet against personally finding his way there too. Number three, the father of botany wrote about it. Purslane caught the attention of one of history's earliest plant scholars. Theophrastus, a student of Aristotle, and often called the father of botany, described it more than 2,300 years ago in his foundational work, Inquiry into Plants, also known as Historia Plantarum. He referred to the plant by its ancient Greek name, Adrachne. Uh, forgive the pronunciation, that's literally Greek to me. Anyway, he wrote about its growth, taste, and usefulness, both culinary and medicinal. In Book 7, which focused on herbaceous plants and pot herbs, no, not that kind of pot herb, he specifically noted purslane, recognizing that this humble plant had real value. Foragers today are part of that long line of observers noticing what others might overlook a plant thriving and nourishing us across millennia. Number four, it's been used as a natural coolant and medicine. 
For centuries, people have turned to purslane not just as food, but for relief. Ancient and not so ancient herbalists crushed its succulent leaves to soothe burns, ease fevers, and calm inflammation, much like we use aloe today. Its juice, cool and slightly tangy, was a simple medicine in a world before pharmacies, a green balm drawn straight from the garden. Even now, foragers notice that its fresh leaves have a refreshing, almost cooling quality when eaten raw. Number five, it's a photosynthesis shapeshifter. This is a neat fact about purslane. It isn't just tough, it's brilliant. Most plants stick to one method of photosynthesis. Purslane, however, can switch between two pathways, making it a true metabolic shapeshifter. When conditions are good and water is plentiful, it uses the fast track C4 photosynthesis, growing quickly and outcompeting its neighbors. But when a heat wave or drought hits, purslane switches to a C4 CAM hybrid. This water saving mode, used by desert plants like cacti, lets it survive as well as any succulent. And that's why purslane doesn't die while your tomatoes are wilting. Number six, it's a mineral sponge. Purslane thrives in places where other plants struggle gravelly yards, cracks in sidewalks, even Dollar Tree parking lots. If you caught my last video about purslane, you already know, but I'll link it for you. Its deep taproot acts like a sponge, drawing up minerals and micronutrients that other plants can't even reach. Magnesium, iron, and calcium all concentrated into its succulent leaves, making it a nutrient-rich powerhouse. Purslane is a pioneer plant, one of the first plants to colonize disturbed soil. By growing where little else will, it loses the earth, adds organic matter when it decomposes, and enriches the soil, what gardeners call green manure. You know what's not manure? Smashing that subscribe button so you don't miss more wild edible expiration. Number seven, not all purslane is wild. What I've been showing you so far is common purslane that hardy little weed that pops up in gardens, parking lots, and cracks in the sidewalk. But gardeners and seed savers have cultivated varieties like Golden and Gruna, bred for thicker, juicier leaves, brighter color, and milder flavor. Some are even grown as compact, bushy ornamentals. Yes, some escape and go feral, but they usually stick around where people are. Purslane is highly adaptable. It naturalizes wherever humans disturb the soil, but generally leaves undisturbed forests, prairies, and wild ecosystems for their native plants. Number eight, it's the plant world's answer to fish oil. You might think you need salmon or tuna for omega-3s, but purslane punches in the same weight class. Ounce for ounce, its leaves are richer in alpha-linolytic acid, ALA, than any other leafy green. While it may not compete with salmon, tuna, or sardines for protein and long-chain omega-3s, purslane still delivers a surprising boost of plant-based omega-3s. And yes, our bodies can convert ALA into longer-chain EPA and DHA found in fish, though not very efficiently. I said inefficient, not ineffective. Number nine, those red stems aren't just pretty. The deep red or purplish stems you see in some purslane varieties contain betalanes, the same antioxidant compounds that give beets their rich color. These pigments do more than make the plants pretty. Betalanes are powerful antioxidants, helping protect our cells from oxidative stress caused by free radicals. They also support liver health by aiding detoxification processes and may help reduce inflammation throughout the entire body. Foragers notice that these stems aren't just decorative. They're a concentrated source of plant-based compounds that can boost overall wellness. Number 10. Thomas Jefferson grew it in Monticello. Remember I mentioned Thomas Jefferson in the intro? Purslane wasn't just a weed in the 1700s. Thomas Jefferson cultivated it 
in his Monticello garden. He valued it for its flavor, its hardiness, and its nourishing qualities. Jefferson wasn't just a statesman. He was an avid botanist, horticulturalist, and all-around scientific experimenter. He lived in the Age of Enlightenment. Imagine that. Curiosity celebrated instead of canceled. And since we're talking about science, yes, purslane has oxalates. No, they aren't scary. They exist in tons of healthy, everyday foods. And frankly, I don't care what Paul Saldino or Sally K. Norton or any other pseudoscience carnivore diet influencer believes. Back to Jefferson, at his Monticello home near Charlottesville, Virginia, Jefferson experimented with hundreds of plants, keeping detailed garden records, and corresponded with fellow plant enthusiasts all around the world. Purslane fit perfectly into his curiosity and love for useful, resilient plants. As he once said, the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. Purslane certainly fits that description. And it still thrives in the gardens of his Monticello estate today. And there you have it. Ten things only foragers tend to notice about purslane. And now you do too. From ancient Mesopotamia to Monticello to American suburbia, from cracks in ancient Roman roads to modern cultivated gardens, this little weed has followed humans for thousands of years. Resilient, nourishing, and full of surprises. So next time you spot purslane creeping up through the gravel, don't just walk past it. Remember its history, its clever adaptations, and the nutrients packed into those succulent leaves and colorful stems. A plant this remarkable isn't just a weed. It's been a companion to humanity for millennia. And if you found this video useful, or at least entertaining, like, share, and subscribe. Every share helps someone learn to eat just a little bit better. And as always, eat the weeds.